with the far right you have to be caught planning to bomb a mosque then it's like all right now we need to prevent referral but anything less than that it's just like yeah well this is like part of normal discourse you know so what if we want to like shoot down boats in the channel if you're a common sense racist <laughs> the whole thing was ridiculous and the only thing that saved them in the end was the fact that labor are just as scummy as they are like yeah this is a really great idea it was saved by labor it tells you a lot about the status that muslims hold in this country in general. Rather than pander to a 4 million bloc, we are much more valuable to them as outsiders and enemies. You guys can't even defeat the racism that exists inside your head and somehow you're going to root out all of this stuff as well. Give me a break. Like, you don't require the Ikhwan or subversive material. Like, you can do it all on your own because there is no greater radicalizing force in the world than Israel's actions in Palestine right now, in certain mosques in East London. A family, you know, used to run prevent delivery. Now, like, they are victims of of the very policies that they once promoted so heavily. A good Muslim is a temporary label always. The people that they're talking about, the people who have no stake in the community whatsoever, they have no presence in the community, you will not find them in a masjid. The organizations that are purely propped up by prevent, by government funding, and if it was not for that funding, the social engineering that takes place, they could never exist. So yeah. it's like you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't in this case because the pathology is always in the Muslim body and mind. The and so are dangerous. You are always suspect. You could be thrown to the wolves. We are only ever limited by the shackles that we place on our own minds. It's been a, it's been a good few days since uh, Michael Gove's announcement and calling you as cage extremist. So my, I guess my first question is, have you been sleeping? Very well. <laughs> I mean, with the exception of the, the usual um, Ramadan lack of sleep and daisiness that comes from Ramadan because of like all the activities that are going on. But Alhamdulillah, in terms of uh, Gove, like, you know, come on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Was this it kind me? of like was tepid, this time? tepid announcements don't really like do anything to yeah. us now. I think we're, we're hardened mm. to them, Alhamdulillah. But I had I had a I had a th I have a theory that every time they try something like this, uh, fundraising efforts kind of become easier. Have you have you found that? I mean, that, there's actually no doubt about that whatsoever. Like, alhamdulillah, like there, there's a like direct correlation between getting attacked publicly and um, you know the amount of yeah. uh, fundraising we're able to do. Alhamdulillah, you know, I remember mm. um, I think it was like Manchester University Press had one of their like best pre-sales for a book when uh, I refused to condemn got attacked uh, in the Telegraph or something. So it's just like, you know, you guys don't do a very good job of like yeah. limiting our work of like, <laughs> that, you know. Well, publicity is silly Oh, uh, yeah, no, alhamdulillah. Yeah. Like, alhamdulillah. Especially from them, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. So how, how's the reaction been with Cage? I mean, um, presumably you knew this was coming. Um, I don't know if you... How it was I mean, they, or... they they were they were they were soft launching it, weren't they, for a while? You know, mm. and then they had this like whole fast where they're like, "Oh my god, we can't believe that somebody like leaked it from our office." I'm <laughs> like, "Come on, you guys, you were the guys who were leaking it in the first place." <laughs> it's, yeah. you, you know, it's like this dance is so funny uh, to watch happen live, um, but yeah, they um, they so they were like obviously soft launching it. They wanted to use the media in order to get certain names out there, and some mm. names even that they didn't mention in the end. But of course, by the time the announcement happens, those names are out there anyway. So it's like, oh, well, we think they're going to say this group and that 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 group. And it's just like, oh, well, you've said it now. Like, yeah. it's like, you know, going back. And of course, the media dutifully plays its role yeah, in terms of uh, highlighting that and amplifying it um mm. in 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 the way that was desired in the first place so you know it, it is what it is um it would have been it would have been i think more interesting had they mentioned more groups rather than the three specifically and of course uh, imam shakil Beg, uh named as an individual on his own but of course the, the main thing is is that the fact the mere fact that he had to like hide like a coward behind parliamentary privilege Mm. Um, tells you everything that you need to know, which is they're shook of saying this publicly. They know that they're on very weak ground. They know that these definitions are amorphous and have little meaning. Um, and so, yeah, it's not something that we're worried about at all. Like, honestly, mm. it, it just, the whole thing just seemed like a farce to us, um, feels like a farce and legally is a farce. 
Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, one brother, I won't mention who it is. He was uh, kind of asking me what my opinion was. I don't really have an opinion, but he was asking what my opinion was about, do you think this is from one of the the final throws of a party on its way out? Or is this from the quote unquote deep state? Or is there something you know else behind it? What, what, what are your views on that? I mean, in terms I, I, of I saw the this new is, definition right. and in terms of what kind of goes been pushing and, and so forth. So there's two things, right? The, one is the aspect of the fact that they wanted this for a very long time with the short cross review uh, and so on and so forth, which I think was now like five years ago that he did the review. Like it's it's been quite some time anyway. I can't even remember how long it's been. It's It got you know pushed into the long grass for so long that you, oh, you, right, yeah. you, can't even rem- you can't even remember when the thing started and when it actually finally got published in mm. the end. Um, and so I feel like we've been living with the specter of this review for a very, very long time. And again, something that was soft launched in many ways. Oh, we think the review is going to say this, or we think the review is going to say that for like years on, on uh, without end. Nice way to um, get so, around to getting sued. Right. Yeah. That is one way of getting around getting sued, right? To get the media to say, we yeah. think that they might say X, Y, Z. Um, so we've known for quite some time that their ultimate unhappiness is that this, the, the prevent strategy, the prevent program, the definitions of extremism um, started to creep into other areas of, of public civic life that they never had intended in the first place. Um, and so basically white folks right like let's just be honest right like, white people got mad that they were that they were being that they were being pulled up as extremists um you know of course and white non-muslim people because uh, you know there's all sorts of white muslims as well alhamdulillah uh, increasingly so alhamdulillah um so they were getting mad about that and and what they saw was a public narrative shift away from focusing on muslims but that, that shift was never something real. It was always something of perception because the data always showed that mm. Muslims were being referred to prevent and channel at much higher rates. So even when people like David Anderson were saying, well, you know, either 25% at one point of the referrals were amongst non-Muslims or 50% of the referrals were amongst non-Muslims, what they were never doing was doing it as a ratio. Mm. So when you're saying 50, if you've got like, you know, 3,000 referrals, 50% Muslim, 50% from uh, outside of the Muslim population. The 50% from the Muslim population comes from a Muslim population of like three and a half, four million people. Whereas the rest comes from a 50 million uh, kind of data set. So what we're talking about is much higher rates of Muslims being referred. And that was always the case, and it continued to be the case. But of course, there was this perception amongst, I think, particularly those who were practicing prevent, they knew intrinsically that this was Islamophobic. And so in order to try and save prevent from its designed Islamophobia, some people who felt uncomfortable, who worked within that system, started pushing much more towards the far right, pushing much more towards kind of narratives of like misogyny and so on and so forth. And it just had this, right, right. And it just started started having this creep that, you know, the Tories were basically like, hey, hey, hold on a second. We never intended this in the first place. Like we just wanted to focus on Muslims, right? And, you know, throw a bone to the far right, even though they're basically the far right themselves. So it's like, you know, even with the far right, that they're, the entire framing of it is well you basically have to be caught planning to bomb a mosque with you know all of the equipment to do so with everything and when you get to that point then it's like all right now we need a prevent referral right but anything mm-hmm. less than that it's just like yeah, well this is like part of normal discourse you know so what if we want to like shoot down boats in the channel like you know that that should be a normal part of public discourse and you know no problem whatsoever for us so you can you can see that they're even within that the way that they speak about the far right it's not um anything that's on the right you know, people like Zach Goldsmith can run entire Islamophobic campaigns against Sadiq Khan 
or no one for a second thinks, should we be looking into this man's house and seeing how his, I think it's six kids are being raised in that household and whether or not we need to intervene? Because mm. clearly, you know, they must be receiving the kind of messaging that this man is willing to display in public, right? So that is never construed. Whereas if we look at the Muslim side of things um, and something similar happens, you know, in a Muslim household where somebody maybe, you know, kind of says something that's a little bit risque, immediately what you're looking at is prevent, you know, rushing mm. in, misconstruing what they're saying, you know, purposely making it about like stopping this person from becoming a terrorist in the future. So it's just riddled with, you know, kind of hypocrisies and contradictions, the entire thing. But it's never been about... Uh, anything other than for them about being Muslims, but of course the other side of it, just quickly, is the ele- you know it's just election uh, posturing. Mm. They're they're desperate. They they need to try and whip up support however much they can in order to try and push back against Labour, who look like they will probably win the next election, and so they're doing anything and everything that they can. But the, probably the most interesting thing was that BBC Question Time when. Uh, Fiona Bruce yeah. asked the audience, you know, like, what do you think of like Gove's new definition of extremism? Do you back it? And they'll, no, like it was just like radio silence in the entire room. I wonder if that's just how much of it is that's just Gove. I mean, he's kind of become a national symbol for like the weasel or the the backstab uh, ineptitude. Or the, yeah, and the, just like uh, even in you know like um, satire shows and and comedy and stuff like that, he's always used as like the the metaphor for the snake or the um, right. You know, he's not very, not very li- liked person. Um, but I thought that was quite. It's been quite heartening to see just the the, the volume of people taking the mick out of it or right. condemning it. Even you know, Islamophobes themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's been interesting to see the number of uh, people who have come out against it. But they obviously have their own political reasons why they're doing so. You know, they. They're thinking about certain careers, certain prospects in the future, um, and so you know, I don't, I don't see like this. this there was this, like rush to say, "Oh, look, Pretty Patel is criticizing it." Like, you know, how bad must Gove be if Pretty Patel is <laughs> criticizing it? I mean, like, you know, these people are not kind of goodwill ambassadors yeah. for well, um, right. the Muslim. The, <laughs> well, I mean, you've got very personal experience with that, you know. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, she, she's, she's been good funding. she be she's been funding your lifestyle <laughs> ever since you uh, you received yeah. some money from her, right? So, uh, <laughs> so um, uh, yeah, I mean, like. You know what can you say? I, mean, I, I think the it. whole thing, the, the whole thing was ridiculous to begin with. The 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 lead up to it was ridiculous. The way in which they planned it was ridiculous. The announcement was ridiculous, and the only thing that saved them in the end was the fact that Labour are just as scummy as they are, right? So that's it. Like the fact that like Angela Rayner was just like, yeah, this is a really great idea, but let's just talk about the mechanics of it. Like, I really want to make sure that we get this down like nuts and bolts, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's that's really where we ended up. It's the, the, the announcement, if it was saved at all, it was saved by labor, which tells you about everything that you need to know about the fact that we do not have any kind of of opposition in this country whatsoever. We have yeah. a blue Tory party and we have a red Tory party. Yeah, yeah. Well, then, with, with regards to the actual definition of extremism, the new one, oh, do you, did you find any maybe uh, silver linings or any steps in the right direction when it comes to, like, you know, you, we notice over the years they, they you know, they, they um, ventured into safeguarding language and discourse and then they kind mm-hmm. of retreated from that. Is you know British values and these types mm-hmm. of kind of vacuous things. Is there anything that you can you looked at and you said, hmm, actually, this is um, this this and this this is quite a good uh, sign that maybe maybe slowly they're kind of um, uh, introducing more and more definitions to make it less and less you know uh, relevant and 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 applicable to people's lives, just so they're kind of phasing it out perhaps to save face rather than a complete kind of PR disaster of, okay, we're scrapping all of this nonsense. And did you, did you ever feel any of those kind of sentiments when you were reading? Um, well, I actually just mentioned it. 
<laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> I mean, if I was if I was at the helm of this and I wanted to kind of save face and were advising on PR and comms and stuff, they don't want to be seen to be you know pandering to their their opponents. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, I mean, they know it's 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 nonsense. They know even in the case in our case, they I saw that one of the the things that they the, the submissions was the government believes that extremism extremism is neither necessary nor sufficient cause for terrorism right and we you know they've they've moved away from the conveyor belt and all this kind of uh, mm-hmm. nonsense they, they they were kind of declaring themselves free of that this was like i think it's more ago. dangerous because it's more amorphous hmm. and i think that's where the danger lies with it um because not only does it um kind of allow for a general sense of extremely subjective views on what impacts on democracy right but it's also the that third part of the definition which says anything that effectively might assist something that might achieve that function in the end which broadens it so far and so wide that almost anything could be captured by that like almost anything like what do you mean when you say these things um, and so I think, I think when definitions are not precise, you end up risking um, subjectivity um, a great deal. And that mm-hmm. subjectivity is never just subjectivity on its own. It always exists in this kind of like miasma of uh, racism and Islamophobia and structural oppression and structural violence, right? So you can never disaggregate it. You can't just say, oh, yeah. And this is what they did with Prevent for so long. People just use their common sense. Mm. Like, if you're a common sense racist, <laughs> then um, then there's going to be violence at the end of the decisions that you make. That's just a reality. Mm. Like, if you're the type of racist who reads the Daily Mail, but is completely oblivious to the fact that you are racist because you you end up nodding your head at the type of articles that, you know, if somebody spoke those out loud in front of me, I'd be like, yeah, you're racist, right? But if you find yourself nodding to those articles and thinking, yeah, this is like common sense, then yeah, you're a common sense mm-hmm. racist. Um, yeah. And that's like the pu- public safety racism that we've seen for so long, you know, which is the public feels that, oh, we have to be involved. We have to play our role in defeating terrorism and extremism and whatever. You guys can't even defeat the racism that exists inside your head, right? And somehow you're going to root out all of this stuff as well. Like, you know, give me a break. Mm. You know, the one thing that was well, that caught my eye was his his focus on ideology and ideologues and mentioning Sayyid Qutub and a few others. Mm-hmm. Allah. Right. And I was just I'm wondering like how... how much maybe is there some kind of hand maybe mm-hmm. from foreign regimes that are that have been avowedly you know anti and cracking down on muslim brotherhood and um these types of figures i'm thinking you know gulf kind of dictators and and stuff like that w- what's your views on that do you think there's any so any any so nod first, given to them we 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 know that this has been part of the trajectory for a very long time so like you know lawrence wright popularizes that the, the the, the thesis of Sayyid Qutb is the ideological forebear of Abdul Azam, who is the kind of um, the mentor to Osama bin Laden. And that, that for them is like the golden chain of, of terrorism, right? Sayyid Qutb to Osama bin Laden. Um, and we saw this in 2012 with the, the trial of Ahmed Faraz, right? Who was convicted um before he successfully appealed it but at first instance he was convicted of um disseminating terrorism publications by selling um Sayyid Qutb's um Ma'alam fi tarikh you know which is milestones mm-hmm. now what what was being argued at that time by the government and it was such a stupid argument you know and which is why on appeal Ahmed Farah succeeded what they said is that if you look at the number of people who have committed acts of terrorism, uh, you'll find that, like, I don't know, I can't remember the exact number, but like 70% of them have a copy of Milestones on their bookshelf. And therefore, there is a direct correlation between <laughs> acts of terrorism and reading this book, 
right? Common Except sense of course, that's <laughs> common sense racism, <laughs> common sense idiocy, common sense yeah. idiocy right? Yeah. Um, whereas the actual data that they should have been looking at, you know, if they had like half a brain between them, is every yeah, single control. person who's ever read milestones from the time that Seth Kotler wrote it up until the contemporary moment and the number of people who have been involved in acts of political violence from that period of time in the 50s up until the present moment that number is infinitesimally small that's the reality okay? I mean, one could and argue, even one then could argue the opposite actually that it would have a it have a lower percentage of criminality compared to the the average of the population <laughs> Right, I mean, not having right. read. <laughs> well, I mean, but then the we book. look at other movements. <clears throat> no, I mean the book. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, look at if, you, but look at all the other movements that have stemmed out of that history and that trajectory, right? Like Rashid Al Ghanoushi, right, himself talks about the fact that Sayyid Qutb was such an important ideological figure in his life, right? Mm. So what we're we now saying that secular secular liberalism. Is um, uh, a a byproduct of Sayyid Qutb, right? Um, and 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 this is the thing that you know works in and of themselves do not produce that violence, right? It's about how individuals uh, interact with the world around them. But of course, they're not willing to look at the world around them because that's too difficult. Then that involves putting up a mirror to themselves and saying, "Oh, what was our role?" in all of mm. this and they don't want to do that it's so much easier so they, they, that's really where Said Qutb first starts at a legal level uh informing policy around what's happening which is Ahmed Faraz and that conviction which is of course as I said appealed but then what happens after Michael Adebolajo uh, murders Lee Rigby on the streets of, of Woolwich they do um led by I think Said the Warsi at the time, they did a report called the Task Force on Tackling Extremism, a terrible, terrible, terrible report. Um, and that's really where they mention at a policy level, Abul Ala Maududi, Sayyid Qutb and Hassan al-Banna as being the ideological forebears of extremism. Uh, you know, again, of course, what's so interesting about, you know, th- these figures in particular right is that they 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 emerge out of a particular historical context which is colonization you know we're talking about say kutub as a child watch british soldiers shoot at his village you know who who grew up with the stories of dinchoe and taba you know these kind of executions and ha- unlawful hangings that took place in egypt you know of hassan al banna also you know similar age living through that entire period they did not come out of a vacuum so much of their perceptions of the world were so informed by the injustices that they saw of the colonial era and of course maldudi was in, in many ways exactly the same he grew up with that legacy of colonization and so what they what they often miss when they talk about these figures and their books and their thinking is you know how much their thinking was informed by the world that they lived in which of course is a a result of the violence of colonization so you know it's so interesting to 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 hear these figures being mentioned as if like somehow they've they found the golden bullet like if we can get rid of these figures uh from the minds and the thoughts and the beliefs of of muslims then somehow we'll we'll, we'll stop extremism we'll stop terrorism and and whatever have you but i mean the, the reality is the vast majority of people that read these works go on to becoming to become quite you know i would say even like neoliberal in their thinking you don't have um the vast majority of the movements that stemmed out of um you know these works did not end up going towards a trajectory of like radical militancy and violence that's just a reality the vast majority of them went into trying to affect change from within the system in whatever way they could um mm. and of course you know there is a that that the hand of the gulf states and all of this you know who have a, you know taken I suppose the, the latter is more dangerous now to um to policy makers who who are invested in the status quo because if it's somebody if there's like a, a an actual militant group that's carrying out mm-hmm. violence then they can easily you know deal with that they don't need these policies and so forth but it's the I don't think it are, is I don't think it is a thing though 
like a lot of these movements i don't see them as being radical in any way like they're not lo- looking to like abolish prisons or looking to yeah. you know change the you know the structures of violence you know they're quite not often they, they 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 work with they work with autocratic military regimes yeah. right in order to <laughs> achieve like small incremental change but within the violence of neoliberalism so i'm not you know i'm not like mm. you know particularly kind of uh, in that mode of thinking where I, when i think that you know some of these you know kind of organizations are somehow going to bring about some kind of like radical change that, that the west needs to be worried about you know in fact if i i i think that there needs to be a re- re-reading of those texts in order to help bring about a much more revol- revolutionary strand of thinking um mm. that we all need at this time when we're seeing so much injustice in the world i think those I those texts are being read wrong yeah I, I mean i agree in that there's there's this kind of level you want to get for but even the the incremental pragmatic kind of um you know um, advocates or advocates for incremental pragmatic change just even working within the system that kind of stuff i think they present more of a nuisance uh, an immediate kind of proximal nuisance to certain uh, agendas if you look at for example just just the, the the spectacle of coming into the streets and and standing up for palestine i think that has represented a big headache for um those invested in the status quo it's not going to like you say no this is not going to overturn the the world order and and do to maybe sure but i mean like if said qutub didn't if said qutub didn't exist <clears throat> maldudi didn't exist if hasna banna didn't exist would these people be on the streets of mm. of london or wherever in in the world that they are they would still be there because i think mm. that what mm. we're seeing with these protests because the genocide <clears throat> because the genocide is being live streamed Mm. is 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 people who have a fundamental understanding of justice coming out to show their support like you don't require an ideological background mm. in the history of the ikhwan okay uh or subversive material in order to come out into the streets of london and protest against what you're seeing mm. to understand that israel um is a zionist settler colonial apartheid regime like you don't you don't require um you know a, a text from you know the, the the 30s the 40s or the 50s to help you do that like you can do it all yeah. on your own because there is no greater radicalizing force uh, in the world than than Israel's uh, actions in in Palestine right now absolutely but how much of that how much of the current um uh, push from gov and his cronies um has been do you think because of Palestine and because of just the timing it seems very I mean part of me is is trying to remember all of you know there's a trajectory to this but part of me is thinking because of the timing because of the some of the the, the iconography used the language the metaphors um the crack the attempted crackdown of uh you know Swell Braverman on uh, Palestine protests and so forth the tussle within the party to kind of go down the more kind of bananistic maybe a uh, uh, a route how much of this is looking at what's happened the solidarity for palestine and maybe pressure from zionist lobbies and maybe kind of reverse engineering okay who's who are the muslims are on who are the easy targets for us to try and you know um weaken the, the these protests to try and not get them given permission by the police ah look at the, the organization xyz what dirt can we dig up on them ah okay yeah hasan bin nasir put them so forth do you think that maybe maybe any thing about that Yeah, I think that might be part of it now because these things are going on so they're using that in terms of their framing. But I come back to to Shawcross that mm. this has been planned for a while <coughs> that you know they want to recentering uh on on Muslims and Islam in particular um because ultimately it suits their electionary purposes. They know that they are in free fall right now the Tories in particular. They know that there is no way of that there's almost no way of saving themselves from the situation they're in unless they can come up with something that is adequately um that would adequately put them back and center as the party that will protect these you know the the, the public from you know the 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 radical islamist extremists so muslims to the rescue <laughs> we can be their safety net <laughs> i mean so, we are we are you know when you think about the fact that 
we are a four million, almost a four million population in the UK. That is a sizable minority. Uh, I think more sizable than I think any other minority in the UK. And yet we have no political utility um, outside of being demonized. And it tells you a lot about the status that Muslims hold in, in this country in general, that they would much rather, rather than pander to a four million block, they would much rather demonize that four million block for the sake of um, their own political expediency. That's mm -hmm. important. It's important for us to think about and reflect on that, that we are much more valuable to them as outsiders and enemies than we ever will be as, uh, as um, you know, allies. Well, up till now, right? One of the things I wanted to, like you reminded me to maybe um, mention as well or ask you about was, so I'm, I'm trying to look at the things that the, the kind of proximal causes to to make sense of the timing and and so forth. So one is Palestine. One is obviously the the the, the trajectory from Shawcross and so forth. Um, one is the fact that there's an election around the corner and they need something. I think some people call it a wedge issue. You know, they, to to try and um, carve out something that 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 uh, against uh, Labour. Uh, but another one is the 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 perceived at least grow, growth and momentum of the Muslim vote, um, especially with <clears throat> the Muslim vote as the Muslim vote and also the Muslim vote kind of campaign. Um, so the first one was, some people can say was, you know, was, was uh, central to the likes of um, George Galloway kind of getting in to um, uh, uh, making the, 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 the mainstream, the, the two main parties come third and fifth or right. something, third and fourth. So I think that was, do you think, or do you think that was, uh, and, and the perceived kind of um, potential and energy and power the Muslims might wield in the next uh, election, do you think that was also part of um, the calculus for, for this new extremism definition? Do you think they're trying, do you think they're, they're trying to um, subvert these efforts? Because, you know, it's being these, these efforts would be subverted as, you know, by um, by the definition. These efforts would be subverted by yeah. the effort, by the definition. Um, you know, especially if Muslims are seen. Uh, remember what happened to Lutfur Rahman, right? Mm. Um, in the the original case that happened against him, that he was using, I think it was like spiritual um, <laughs> undue, undue spiritual influence, undue spiritual influence, right? I think it's like a two hundred so, year old uh, law or something, <laughs> right? So. I mean, it's like, it's it's bizarre, um, but it tells us about the trajectory that they're on, mm. right? They want, the, the, it, it, it's, it's like a double bind, right? If you, if you don't get involved in democracy, they they say that you are outsiders, that you, you're against the system, whatever else. And if you do, you're then you're, you're, you know, kind of trying to subvert the system by using the system against itself. So yeah. it's like you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't in this case, because the pathology is always in the Muslim body and mind. It's always dangerous, regardless of what it chooses to do. So if you decide that, oh, hold on a second, I want to actually use my vote in order to let people know that I'm disaffected, that I'm mm. disenfranchised, that even somebody as utterly obnoxious uh, as George Galloway, right? Um, you know, somebody who... Um, Will pander to anyone that you know he feels will support his cause. So he is, ver you know, literally, you know, in, within the same week is willing to like s talk about Islamophobia, but then also kind of pander to the far right and talk about you know all these immigrants coming to the country and changing their ways of life. It's like, you know, the the fact that people are willing to put somebody like that front and center. It tells you a lot about where their politics are right now in relation to how dis dissatisfied they are with the the, the two party system that we mm. have in this country. Um, the fact that they don't feel represented, the fact that they feel very strongly about what's happening in Palestine. And you're absolutely right. I think the new definition might play a role in in that future. But I don't think that we as a bloc represent anything more than you know, a few lost seats here and there. 
which is fine. And I think like groups like the Muslim Vote uh, are doing an admirable job in some respects of um, giving the, the mainstream parties a bloody nose, letting them know that you know there are certain things that they just can't take for granted and Palestine is one of those things. That's fine. But is it going to shift? Yeah, a genocide. And is it, is it going to shift an entire election? I, I can't see how the numbers would would even because especially when you think just about the fact where Muslims are concentrated, right? So <clears throat> there's I think one million Muslims in London alone. Um, so it's not like we're we're spread across in significant numbers every constituency in the UK. In fact, if we were, we'd actually be less effective because then our uh, mm. our numbers would would be too um, uh, disperse. So I think. I, I was browsing the doing, Muslim vote kind yeah. of um, the spreadsheet that they have. It's very useful. You yeah. can see, I think, about maybe 40 plus um, constituencies where the Muslim electorate constitutes more than the swing in the last election. So it is kind of, we did pun- punch above our weight, so to speak. But the, the challenge is That's assuming is that they, that they and, voted uh, in a way that takes that, that, that you see, they, yeah. they could have voted with the the person who uh, won the yeah. election or whatever else, or even actually could have voted for the person who, who came second. So yeah. that's where the data gets a bit fudged, right? Like, mm. yeah, you could say, well, there are this many Muslims and this was the amount of swing, but we don't know how those Muslims exactly voted yeah. or which side they voted on because we don't know that data. Mm. Then we don't know whether or not that swing just for Muslims alone is possible. But I, yeah. I think... I, I think they take that into account. Muslims. There's a smaller number as well, which is, I think, less than... Uh, fewer than 20 maybe or 25 mm-hmm. where they're actually and um, they considered that and and there's there's actually you know even possibility of standing up an, an independent because the majority is so large uh, the yeah. the electorate is so large but i mean there's other challenges you know activating people people are dissatisfied they you know they, they're like what's the point and angry with the um with the system which is understandable but i think i mean we've got some work to do on that regard but um, I wanted to ask you, you, you keep mentioning they, right? You keep saying they, 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 they want to do this in, in terms of, you know, talking about uh, the extremism definition and, and prevent and so forth. When you say they, what do you refer to here? So some, you know, is it deep state? Is it a few organizations? And well, it's not, it's not, an, it's not an octopus, right? Yeah. It's, uh, it's, um, it depends on you know what specific you know policy we're talking about. Quite often, of course, it is um, you know security agencies the way mm. in which they, they they map out exactly what you know needs to happen from a national security perspective in this country. Um, they're heavily involved in helping to to design um, those programs. You know, if you think about you know all those individuals who are involved, especially in like think tanks like Rusi with the original Prevent programming. Right, it tells you a lot about how these think tanks mm. do have an impact on the way that government policy is formed. They're seen mm. as being credible voices within that field, um, and the problem is that you know these are institutions that are involved in a great deal of violence around the world, yeah. and so we we end up bearing the brunt of that. But of course, you know, th- th- these are never neat uh, associations. So sometimes what you'll find is that the Tories will say something that the security agencies will be like, no, like we don't agree with that at all. Um, like, like for example, in the case it wasn't the Tories, it was Labour, with, but with the Iraq war, the advice that was coming from inside of MI5 was this is a bad idea because there will be blowback that comes from this. So... You might think of them as one, but their, their hearts are right. all over the place. Right. And so when we say they, we are, we're generally talking about the institutions of the state, mm. right? Um, as, as, as something that come together in a general, they have a, a same direction that they follow. And that ultimately comes out in, the, in, in, in policy. Um, but it's never neat. Um, and it's important that we understand and recognize that. Yeah. So you mentioned RUSI, Royal United Services um, Institute. And um, what other kind of, you mean, you've written extensively on the Henry Jackson Society, for example, their links to <clears throat> extremism analysis unit and, and getting kind mm-hmm. of one thing that, that came out of the case, um, uh, the judicial review and the defamation case that we, we, we took was that they, there's something called this extremism analysis unit, very opaque, 
Um, you keep on mentioning the case. I think you should you should yeah. just give a quick summary of what what your case was, so that so people f- understand. So um, we we took the government to court on two two kind of charges, so to speak. One was yeah, a, but you keep on saying we. You you yeah. mean you 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 <laughs> some month back? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You were called an extremist. Me and the by, <laughs> <laughs> on behalf of the Ummah. Uh, like, yeah, you're called an extremist by Priti Patel. Yeah. Right. Not Priti Patel, actually. It was before her uh-huh. time. She oh, was okay. just the one who uh-huh. apologized at the end. Which is why she's nice, you know, <laughs> nice person. She, she's all right. But uh, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was actually in Theresa May's time when she was Home mm-hmm. Secretary and David Cameron was uh, Prime Minister. It was a 10 down actually press release. They included uh, my name in and some notes, and it said uh, you know, extremists, whatever. Um, but yeah, that allowed me to take two cases. One is a judicial review, um, arguing that prevent itself is unlawful, and um, ultra view is that the government doesn't have the right, <clears throat> the legal right to police something called extremism because they were given the right by parliament to stop terrorism. And we argue that terrorism is something, it has a definition. Extremism is infinitely broad and, and, and so forth. Uh, in that regard, we're waiting for um, a hearing at the European Court of Human Rights, inshallah. Mm-hmm. Could be a number of years, they said. But uh, the defamation case, um, the the defamation case, alhamdulillah, we, we, we won, they, they apologize and, uh, and so forth uh, about two years ago. But um, during this case, what came out was <clears throat> like thousands of um, pages of documents and stuff that were pre- previously kind of um, um, confidential about some this shady department called the Extremism Analysis Unit, um, and also that some of the the on the digital tools that they've been using, they and other right. kind of departments, um, to kind of scan people's uh, online. Mm-hmm personas their all their social media and so forth and make determinations about if they're so-called extremist or not right. and um and by the way privacy international the ngo also in, uh, mm-hmm. joined at the european court of human rights level as an interested party so they wrote, wrote something uh, quite interesting so a kind of sub- submission um I, I i i will be sharing actually when we we get, get some more kind of information about the um the the european court of human rights kind of hearing or, or that level you know more kind of stuff about this, inshallah. But during that time, we 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 had you know there was there was a gold mine of I think just information and and stuff about and Marshall Cage and uh, yourself, Asim, you did uh, a few reports and you know um, Marshall Tabarakallah. Um, so tell us about some of the some of the goodies, some of the stuff that you that you uncovered. Uh, right, I mean from, from yeah, the, exactly the, the shady that. workings of the extremism analysis unit. So, you know, I think the biggest win, other than outside of you literally getting an apology um, from, you know, kind of from the government, from the Home Secretary, um, was this whole raft of documentation that we received um, about a process that, you know, we were all completely in the dark about. So they're making determinations about, you know, the Muslim community in the UK about black groups, uh, black rights groups, and so on and so forth all the time. We kind of knew that, but I don't think we knew the depth of what was taking place and how closely it was tied to counter uh, counter terrorism. So just as an example, you know, you have, um, you know, advising this extremism analysis unit, which is an entity that sits inside of the home office, right? So it is a function of the home office. It's part of um, the counterterrorism um, uh, infrastructure that we have in the UK. So advising it, right, on a six monthly basis is the prevent delivery unit. So prevent is directly involved in advising extremist analysis unit. Uh, the Joint Terrorism Analysis Centre, the Foreign Office, the Department for Education, the Department for Communities and Local Government, Department for Health and the Police. So you have all of these institutions that are working together in order to make, ultimately, uh, 
um, determinations about mm. individuals and groups. And this was already going on, okay, for a very long time. And, and just as a, an aside, um, you know, all that work that was done on the gangs matrix and database comes out of this work as well, right? Mm-hmm. So the extremism analysis unit, they have, they produce something known as the extremism, the domestic extremism database, which is where people like you and I will probably have a file, which makes a determination about us in some way. We'll have like all manner of like newspaper clippings and, you know, reports and articles and tweets and, you know, everything that's hoovered up into this determination that's made, been made about, you know, who we are, what we're about, what kind of risk we pose, that kind of thing. It's, it's very, very, very much akin to, um, what J. Edgar Hoover was doing with the FBI, especially during the peak of um, the black civil rights era. Right, exactly. You know, um, they, they would label all sorts of people like uh, dangerous black nationalists. Um, mm-hmm. and ironically, even those who were working with the government would be labeled as dangerous black nationalists, which was like quite quite ironic in and of itself. Because sellouts so, were dangerous. <laughs> I mean, you know, the thing is, is that you're never safe, right? Yeah. Because if you understand that they see... Um, extremism as an ap- a pathology that exists inside Muslims, then you are, you are always suspect regardless of what you do. Mm. At, at, at any given point, you could be thrown to the wolves. And, you know, there's been some recent kind of talk about stuff that's going on in, in certain mosques in East London where, you know, uh, a family uh, who, you know, used to run prevent delivery and be involved in prevent programs are now like talking, you know, as if they are victims of the very policies that they once yeah. uh, promoted so heavily. And so, you know, you, you wonder if, if there's ever the possibility of ever being safe from these things. So the, the, the extremism is... Uh, so what you're saying is that a good Muslim is a temporary label always? Of course, of course. It's very... Um, it's a very superficial label, the, the good Muslim, because you can become the bad Muslim just as easily. You know, we've seen like the fall of, of Marjid Nawaz from the grace of public eye. Um, you know, he was fine as long as he was like calling out Muslims and whatever else. But the moment he steps out of line in relation to uh, a public discourse, then that's it. He's like thrown away as some kind of like conspiracy theorist, uh, which he is. You know, I mean, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying. To, I'm not out here defending the like kind of the, the, crazy, the, 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 the crazy views that he's been expressing, right? Mm-hmm. But my point is, is that like at some point, it's too much for them, right? And they will mm-hmm. just like revert to type and say, you know, we, we we thought this guy was a dodgy guy all along, right? Um, so I, th- I think, yeah, going back to the domestic streaming database, the problem with it is that you don't know how having that file is going to affect your long-term prospects in the future. Um, so if we look at, for example, the, the range of um, measures that can be taken based on an accusation of extremism, and that includes everything from having your citizenship um, being taken away from you through to having your passports removed, being put onto financial sanctions orders, mm-hmm. even in some cases <clears throat> having your children taken away from you. The, and this is why I think your case was so important which is to let people know that the label of extremism does carry danger. It is precarious to be labeled as an extremist, right? Um, so that unit, who are they talking to? Are they, are, they, are they saying, oh, well, we need to be fair about this. Let's make sure that we're studying you know, the material that these guys are producing and we're talking to them themselves. Let's have an open process, nothing like that whatsoever. They talk to the people they want to talk to. So they'll talk to organizations like the Henry Jackson Society, which is a um, new conservative think tank that has promoted a hot wars against Muslims abroad and cold wars against Muslims uh, in the UK, mm. right? This is the type of organization that they were meeting with on a week by week basis and you know the documentation that your case provide us literally spell that out in detail that you know these are the groups that we're speaking to um constantly and consistently 
So who who is it that um, Riku, which is the overarching body, um, the Research and Information Communications Unit, I believe, inside the, the Home Office, um, and under it, the Extremism Analysis Unit, who are they turning to? They're turning to organizations with a track record of anti-Muslim bigotry and Islamophobia to mm-hmm. make it, to make their determinations, which then tells you everything that you need to know. You know, it's not like they're going to um, my lawyer friends or going to like Clive Stafford Smith and asking him, you know, oh, as somebody who's done a lot of work with Cage, you know, what do you think about them? They're not interested in that. Good, they're just interested in... <laughs> Right, right. They're just interested in this kind of like McCarthy-esque witch hunt, you know. It's, and it's it's literally got the House of Un-American Activities written all over it. Just mm. the way that they make determinations, the way that they keep files, and it, and and I don't think it's going to be that long before we will have those types of public hearings. I mean, we already did kind of anyway with the with the review into the Muslim Brotherhood, which was like this whole spectacle that was done for. Not only the yeah, public, the British that. public. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's been so much, right? Yeah. Like, I, even me, I forget about stuff all the time. And I'm, mm. somebody reminds me, I'm like, oh, yeah, damn, they did that as well, right? You know, because they just, they move so fast. And that's, that's always the problem with, you know, all of these um, efforts that we have in trying to hold the government to account. By the time we have, like, a success, like in your case, They've already shifted the goalposts significantly mm. in the two, three, four, five years that it took <clears throat> to get some degree of justice on a single issue, right? Mm. By then, it's almost like your win becomes irrelevant in some respects. Mm. It's still important, and we should still be bringing those types of cases. But now we're dealing with a whole panoply of other policies and legislation that are, are making our lives difficult in other ways. You know... Whenever we talk about extremism and prevent and the counterterrorism matrix, mm. um, I'm always concerned for people that might look at what we say and think, "Oh, damn, yeah, it's, it's quite an, you know it, it, they could take your kids away, could do this or that." I'm just going to keep my head down, you know. I don't I'm going to be fearful of being called an extremist. I'm right. going to just you know cooperate whenever. What do you say to that that type of person who who might think, "Damn, yeah, this is." This is quite scary stuff. It's only scary if you let it be scary. Um, I think, I think one of the legacies of of Cage of our work, you know, having done this work since two thousand October two thousand and three, is that um, you're only limited by your own uh, inability to have an imagination for yourself and what it looks like to have a future. Um, if you base your entire metrics solely on what you think the other side will allow you to do, you will never get anything done. And because Mm -hmm. Cage internally, we don't have that at all. We do not let our detractors and our enemies dictate for us what is possible in our own imagination for what what we think of it as a just uh, future for ourselves and for the whole of society in a way it's liberating if they close a the door we find another one to open it to, to open it, it and it, this happens all the time with us so we have an event cancelled okay and we're like okay fine this event got cancelled what do we do now how do we how do we organize the next one and guess what within like a week we found another venue we're doing the event the event's better than the, the original one that we had planned like doors open but it's a matter of of the heart and i think that's something that uh, people quite often forget that it's the heart that has to be connected to this type of work and if it's not then of course your analysis entire is entirely materialist the analysis is completely materialist um just over this weekend i was um hosting the um uh the cage iftars uh, for Ramadan that we do every every year during during the month of Ramadan, and I made the point, you know, Malcolm Gladwell has this thesis about David and Goliath, the story of David and Goliath, David Dawood Ali Salam being the prophet of God, and Goliath being this like, you know, mighty 
warrior that was a giant. David's this little boy. And Gladwell's thesis is this, that actually there's nothing remarkable about this story in the sense that all it is really is a little kid with a with extreme intelligence about him and a great deal of skill with the slingshot. And so like, you know, if you understand that with the right levers in the right moment at the right time, the right skill set, you can achieve a great thing, mm-hmm. then that's it. You're able to achieve that great thing over an overwhelming force and you know Jalut or Goliath was much bigger than David he would have crushed him with you know probably a single blow but Gladwell's analysis is a materialist one which is you know this skillful intelligent young boy was able to leverage the slingshot in order to defeat the bigger foe whereas the Quran paints gives Goliath us... as some kind of bumbling kind of um, right uh, right weak, right uh, right right whereas the Quran thing. does the Quran does not give that view at all of the story what does mm-hmm. the Quran inform us? The Quran informs us about that story in particular, that it was Allah's hand that permitted the defeat of Jalut and his forces, right? That David was there just to play his role, right? Which is to, to, to take an action, to put himself forward. But like with Badr, like um, with every single instance of the victories that Muslims have ever had, it's it's about the individuals who are who are taking action, having a heart that's connected to Allah in the moment when they are when they are facing an overwhelming force. You know, Musa salam, Allah does not require Musa salam, to touch the water with his staff to split the sea. Like it, Allah does not mm. require him to do it. Like, there's no like reason why he should touch it. He's capable of splitting the sea all on his own. Mm. Uh, subhanahu wa taala. But it, it, the, the point being is that Musa alayhi salam needs to believe in his heart in that moment that my Lord has commanded something of me and that if I have certainty in that and I touch this water, it will part by his will alone. And so, uh, you know, having, I think having an organization, you know, whose, whose members have this about them, they have this understanding that, that we are only ever limited by the shackles that we place on our own minds. Um, I think it makes a big difference. And mm-hmm. alhamdulillah, I think that's the reason why we have been, um, I don't know about successful, but why we have been present for so long in this space, um, you know, despite like great, great challenges. Yeah. I mean, speaking of challenges, it's been 10 years since your bank accounts were closed. And mashallah, you've gone from strength to strength. You know, is that because Bitcoin's gone up or... <laughs> <laughs> I wish I I wish we had that much Bitcoin. I wish I wish uh, I don't even know if we have any. I'll be honest with yeah. you. Um, I um, you know honestly, like if you were to ask anybody inside Cage, like how how have you managed to survive ten years? Not just survive, but you've account. grown. You've become an international. We've grown. Uh, right, absolutely. NGO. You know, in two thousand and three, I was uh, well. Yeah, I think it's 2005, because that's when we had uh, my first employment. Um, as the only sole employee to having like almost 20 members of staff and also globally, it's a big mm-hmm. deal that we're, we're, we're still, alhamdulillah, and, and this is from Allah's Fadl. You yeah. know, honestly, you ask the people inside Cage who run the admin, who run the organization, the administration of it, like, you know how how did you manage to get through this and and increase in size and capacity and you know help so many people um you know especially since the the bank account closure i don't think anybody can actually tell you well, it, 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 well we had a plan and this is exactly how it happened i think you know when you see people driving all the way from scotland just so that they could drop a donation to you because they know that your bank accounts are closed and you don't know who these people are you've never met them mm. before in your life and they're just there to inform you that, you know, you are supported by this community. And remember, this is an organization that has no government funding, that has no institutional funding, no grant funding. It is 100% supported by the Muslim community in the UK. Or, you know, kind of make, uh, there must be non-Muslims as well who support us. And in fact, I know that there are. Mm. But predominantly Muslims in the UK. Right, and so that's a genuine grassroots organization, and it's important that we have these grassroots organizations. When you look at like all those other organizations that came over the years, whether it was um, Inspire 
or Quilliam Foundation or, you know, these new ones like the campaign mm-hmm. against anti-Semitism that Gove mentioned in his in his speech about us, right? We call them AstroTurf organizations. Why? Because they cannot organize a single event in the UK that would provide them the funds that they need to do their work. Like, you know, you know what us Muslims are like, Salman, right? Some, you could, you could start a charity tomorrow saying, you know, that was trees for Jannah, right? Literally, you could, you could um, institute this organization tomorrow, put up a website. You'd send, you'd send like a dozen tweets out and spam my WhatsApp, like endlessly, mm-hmm. like you normally do, right? Um, saying, come to this event and help plant trees for Jannah, right? So that, you know, we get Ajar for the afterlife. And you would have a packed room full of 200, 300, 400 people mm-hmm. all eager to give their money to this cause because that's what Muslims are like. They want to support good organizations and good initiatives, right? So, you know, it's so funny <laughs> when uh, people like Gove and, you know, all of these people talk about, like, you know, we, we're, we're the, the silent majority, right? The silent majority, we have to represent them. The people that they're talking about, the people who have no stake in the community whatsoever, they have no presence in the community. You will not find them in a masjid. You will not find their organizations being talked about in laudatory ways mm. by the community. These are the organizations that are purely propped up by prevent. They are propped up by government funding. And if it was not for that funding, this social engineering that takes place, they could never exist. And it is also a lesson that not to kind of uh, attack anyone, but anyone who does succumb to that pressure, they end up having a much more difficult life and work in their, in their organizations. And, um, and I can think of a few just sort of my head that there's, there's been no longevity, you know, those that have been <clears throat> not to impute anything negative on their intentions. Cause it's, you know, it's, it's a tough, uh, it's tough to have uh, to 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 take a principled position, but I, I find again and again that if you do take a principled p- position, and you basically tell the counter extremism, you know, m- m- industry to to get lost, then they'll just go on to the next. They'll take the path of least resistance, you know, whether it's gaining surveillance, whether it's just putting pressure, whether it's just ticking box with their quotas. They were going to try and get into some organization somewhere or a mosque or youth club or whatever. And you know, she, look like Imam Shakil, for example, was mentioned. Like, the, the, go mention some orgs, and then Imam Shakil as an you know as an, an umma unto, unto himself. Umma. Mashallah, yeah. uh, Imam Shakil has uh, and Lewis Islam Center has been the most kind of vociferously anti-prevent, anti-extremism, uh, you know, voice. They didn't let any any kind of for the sake of oh, you know, we have to build bridges and all that kind of stuff. No, no, no. They they completely shut off prevent and not, nothing to do with anti extremism and, and, and so forth. But their community is thriving. Their masjid is thriving. Mm. Mashallah, tabarakallah. Their actual um, the 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 relation, the actual real life relationships with actual on the ground people between Imam Shakil, between the masjid and non Muslim neighbors, the the priests, the the rabbis, the the neighbors, the even the pol- the police, the council, and so forth. The actual real life interactions are very strong, and those are the people that are coming, you know, uh, coming out and 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 speaking in defense of people like Imam Shakil and Lewis and Santin, Islamic Center. But if you if you contrast that with someone who th- feels because of that almost uh, that imaginary fear of of the potential what might happen, they 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 open the door. And I call them like bailiffs or the TV license people. I don't know if that's a real or so urban legend or something. If you let them in, then they have to, you know, uh, kind of uh, look around and and everything. But if you just and, and yeah, they they embed themselves. They they start to they might start saying, you know, oh, this is a nice, you know, um, shoe rack. Let's let's build you another one. Uh, are you doing a, a, a you know a, a, a kids um, football tournament? Yeah, let let's let's sponsor that. And then slowly they'll be like, oh, we noticed this poster you know have you have you, have you thought about who, who that guest is you're inviting and that slow kind of embedding their tentacles into your community and it's mm-hmm. it's it's it ends up making life more difficult for you so if anybody is feeling that you know um oh no i, I better just keep my head down i don't want to be called an extremist mm-hmm. i better kind of volunteer <clears throat> cooperation and a, a, a kind of acquiescence then it, it only make as far as i'm I, i've seen 
uh, I could be wrong, but it only makes your job difficult later on. But if you show a, a clear and principled sunset, look, uh, you as an individual have got no problem, but you as representing prevent or representing the counterterrorism matrix, I, you know, we we politely politely decline, you know, any any um, interaction with you as as an official of this policy, which is we believe is racist based on pseudoscience and, and counterproductive. And Cage is an Absolutely. example of that. Lewisham and Mamshkid is an example of that. <clears throat> so you know, you've you've actually grown, and 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 we expect this from all all organizations that show a that have the grassroots support and have a good strategy in mind don't don't portray it like you were just kind of you know you don't know what you're doing you were just kind of you know you do guys you do have a strategy because i don't want to go to the opposite extreme with people thinking just you know be nice inside and, and don't plan properly you know plan you know you have all your planning and and much of the people that do that maybe not you you're the the kind of you're 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 buried in the books all the time, but mashallah, you've got different people, different expertise, mashallah, and we need that for our community, different organizations. Um, just before we wrap up, I wanted to um, get your thoughts on, I, I noticed Sar, Dame Sara Khan's uh, report, <laughs> you know, coming back to an old friend of yours, uh, as Kate, yeah. you know, have you had a chance to, to, to look at that? Um, just briefly, I've, um, I, uh, <clears throat> looked at um this this whole new uh thing that she's trying to push out to do with i'm just gonna have a quick so free free um, speech i googled it just now and yes uh, the, <laughs> which, quite... is, which is really I ironic right like you know she doesn't want people to be bullying other people anymore and i i, I vividly remember um one of my one of my colleagues and actually um uh uh, she, uh, Nadia Ali, she wrote one of the chapters in my previous book, I Refuse to Condemn, really beautiful chapters worth, worthwhile checking out that, that that essay that she wrote. But I remember um, Inspire and all these kind of like AstroTurf um, uh, organizations really publicly hounding her after she, tried, after she critiqued um, the kind of counterterrorism role that they play. And so it's kind of like a little bit... Um, you know, ironic that she's trying to like talk about social cohesion. She's trying to talk about, you know, kind of not having this atmosphere where people get attacked and bullied online when she has herself been involved in this kind of really vicious, vapid bullying of, um, you know, an academic who, you know, was really just kind of trying to like present her critiques of, of structural violence and structural racism. Not so, that, but on an yeah. institutional level as well, this, you know, and they've been they they it's 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 like unbelievable it's literally incredible that you know they they they're talking about bullying online bullying and pressuring mm -hmm. people and social cohesion and and free speech a danger to free speech when these are the things that they've been on a systemic structural level they've been um fighting against when it comes to the despised minorities Absolutely. I mean, you know, they, I think they've done more work than anybody in saying that, you know, shut down this Muslim organization, shut down that group, shut down this uh, activity. Mm -hmm. It's just so it's just like, OK, so who do you actually want to speak? Is it just people like, uh, you know, what's his name? Murray Goodwin and, uh, you know, uh, Lawrence Fox. So these are, are, are these are the, the kind of great advocates of free speech that you're really trying to defend here, because that if that's who it is, then, well, you know, good luck with that. Exactly, um, bro. We've got a quick, uh, just a quick fire, a uh, few questions before we wrap up, right? Um, name a recent book or audio book that you would recommend. It's going to be hard for you because. Uh, I so I just, it. although I I, I I read it some time ago, I just published um, a, a review of Suhaima Manzur Khan's uh, book, um, Seeing for other, uh, for ourselves and other possibilities. One of the most fantastic. Um, books I've read in a very long time. In fact, I, I recommended it to, to Dr. Uthman Latif, and we met up recently. And he, he like he took me by the arm. He said, "Us and this book is unbelievable." <laughs> um, it's it's it's, it's, it's it, you know. Okay, I, I guess the best way of problem. describing it is that it is it is a recentering of Al Tawheed in a way that really centers us looking at understanding that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is a, the primary object of who sees us in everything that we do in, a, in, a, in an age where 
like social media, we're doing things for likes and clicks and to be praised and whatever. She really centers us to this idea of who, who are we doing anything for? So it's really a book about the Ayub and Nefs, the diseases of the heart. Mm. Like she does it in a way that's, that's, that's really beautiful and poetic. And it's a very short, slim, slim book. Highly recommend okay. it to everybody. Sold. <laughs> I'll definitely take a look, Honestly. inshallah. Um, next, which gadget other than your phone do you value the most? Oh, wow. Um, which gadget do I value the most? Oh, yeah. The headphones. Noise ca- <laughs> noise cancelling headphones, man. Noise cancelling okay. headphones. <laughs> when you're on a flight or you're taking your kids to their gym activities yeah. and it's just noise everywhere, just being able to like sit in silence is, is a miraculous thing. <laughs> when there's an ambulance behind you in traffic. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, I, I, hopefully I don't have these on when I'm sitting in my car because yeah. they were bigger problems than if I do. Yeah. Which website or app would you encourage others to visit or download? Cage.geo. <laughs> nice little plug. Okay, finally, <clears throat> finish the sentence. Yeah. If our audience would remember one thing from this podcast, it would be? It would be uh, not to get distracted. Oh, thanks, bro. <laughs> it would be not to um, to get distracted by the, the the bang and the pomp of public declarations, and to really situate Allah's quwa, Allah's power in your heart, so that you understand that there is nothing that anybody can do to you except by Allah's permission. Well, wow, mashallah, zakla khair, bro. Uh, Dr. Asim Qureshi, Research Director of CAGE And Zak Makhairan to you watching at home If you like this podcast, give a like and a share And remember to follow wherever you get your podcast That's it from myself and our gracious guest Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh